I'm Jennifer Nicholas and I'm a third year trainee at UEL. Um, I think clinical psychology is interesting because from a young age it's not something that you might typically think of. You know about nurses, you know about lawyers, etc. So it wasn't something from a really young age I knew I wanted to do. But um, where I really, what I really had to look at is like where are my strengths, what am I good at and what I'm really interested in. So things like I was interested in uh, English and I was interested in biology um, and by following just kind of the things that I was interested in, I was good at, actually led quite nicely into thinking about things like sociology, thinking about taking psychology at A-level and um, and then you start to see where all of these things connect. So for example, because I really like English, there was all the writing and report aspect. There's a reason I liked biology. There was like the brain aspect. Um, so yeah, so for me, it was really like, where are my strengths? Where are my interests? And what career could this lead into? And then doing psychology at undergrad, I was like, okay, yeah, this is really interesting. I want to take it to the next level. So for me, it was seeing where are my strengths and interests. And then, and then later on, like when I had a few work experiences, realizing actually there's something really special about being with people when they're most vulnerable and not everyone can manage that or handle that or is interested in that. And so I felt like that was some, somewhere I wanted to be. And what is, I think, particularly special about clinical psychology compared to other types of psychology is that they don't just focus one-to-one. -one, they do think a bit wider, like, um, yes, this person's in distress, but what's happening around this person that might be making them feel this way? What can be done on a wider level as well as one-to-one? -one? So for me, it was just a mix of what I was interested in, what subjects I was good at, and then going into the work and thinking, yeah, this is what I want to do. So um, my top tips for getting relevant work experiences is really dependent on where you are in your clinical psychology journey. So I guess if you're right at the beginning and you're thinking, is this for me? Top tips at that stage would be think about voluntary work and think about um, working with communities or groups of people that are vulnerable or across the age span just so you can get a bit of idea if this is something that you might be interested in so for example when I was um, at uni I volunteered as a befriender with the National Autistic Society trying to see just see just kind of test the waters if this is what I want to do and then I guess if you're on the other end where maybe you've come out of uni and you're kind of thinking what's relevant work experience um, you want to start thinking about paid jobs I think what's important here, I think it, everyone's going to say the same thing. The gold standard is an assistant psychologist, but they're not very easy to get and not everyone gets them, including myself. So I just wanted to point out as well that even though there are assistant jobs, there are so many other jobs. And what you're, again, you're really looking for is preferably in the NHS, but it doesn't need to be in the NHS. You need to find a job where, where you have access, again, to the populations that clinical psychologists work with. Um, so, for example, in mental health. And, and again, if you don't have a clinical psychologist directly supervising you, that can be difficult. But what's really important is try and find a clinical psychologist, maybe you, in your service that you can go and talk to, ask them a bit about their role, ask them what, about what you're doing in your work that relates to clinical psychology. Do they have any tips? Could they even offer supervision? And they might say no, but that's, that's fine. Another thing I think about, especially if you're not specifically in an assistant role, but even if you are in an assistant role, is really getting down on paper or, or on your computer about what work you're doing, the clients you're working with, and really thinking about, okay, I learned those theories, those psycho psychological theories at uni, and how is this applicable to the work I'm doing now? And on a very basic level, after you've kind of recorded that and thought about what's the theory behind this, reflect on it and I think that's a really important skill particularly if you're thinking how is this work relevant so in a very basic way you can kind of use one of the cycles is called the Gibbs reflective cycle and it could be something like what's the work I done what went well what didn't go so well how did I feel about the work and what am I going to do next time so I think like I said the assistant psychologist job isn't the only job um, and 
most jobs you're going to do is going to be relevant to clinical psychology. And the important bit is, again, applying the theories and then reflecting on that process. And that's what makes work experience relevant. So I think one of the do's for the clinical psychology application form is definitely do put time aside for it. Um, it's a very different form and um, it only comes around once a year. And I know that sounds like a lot of pressure, but you do need to put time aside because it, it is quite a unique form. So especially the part I think about the personal statement, because you have a part where you, you're just listing your experiences. The personal statement really is about reflection and really evidencing how you're ready personally for clinical psychology training and your journey so far and why, how that's made you ready to train to be a clinical psychologist. So yes, I'd say definitely do put some time aside to work through that process so you can review things, get people to check it. Um, another do is definitely look at the universities you're applying for. So on one hand, this could be things like, oh, there might be really, you might have particular interests or clinical skills that you want to develop that certain unis focus on. But on the other side, on a very practical side is some unis don't actually take on people that, um, that might have scored under 65% in their uh, undergraduate psychology degree, or some have entry tests and as long as you do their entry te test and pass that, you can get through to interview stage. So it's really important to look at the course criteria. I think that's a definite do. Um, don't, I think, don't forget to bring yourself into the form. And I think that can be really difficult because with how competitive clinical psychology is, you just want to present yourself in a way that you think, oh, courses all like this. This is what courses other people and definitely do that like there's certain criteria you definitely have to hit but you don't want to just be a clone as well and you really need to stand out in a way so if you can do that in your personal statement do so but also remember there's like the hobbies bit and really try and bring a flavor of you into the form when you're on this journey of, um, of trying to become a clinical psychologist clinical psychology can look like this but this should be you and then clinical psychology should be a little bit and the courses want to see that as well they want to see that you're going to be able to handle this because you have a life outside of clinical so i'd say yeah definitely don't forget to bring yourself out in the application form so the first thing i want to say is you if you've got to the interview stage that's a huge achievement so don't forget that um one big don't i guess is to um, don't forget that that if you are at the interview stage they they liked what you did on paper or they liked what you did in your entrance test and they think that you're a really good potential candidate for the role um, i know that can be a lot of pressure but i think that should re remind yourself of that to give you that confidence as well um, you're not going to have time to remember every single model or every single um clinical example that you have or every theory or every research method so do prep do have like a handful of, of good solid things to go in with do um, talk to people that either um, that attend the course as trainees if you can um, do try and talk to um, people that are linked to the course where possible but my, I guess my biggest do is definitely do, 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 do practice. So practice with your supervisors, practice with psychology friends, practice with non-psychology friends, practice with yourself in the mirror, because a lot of it linked to what I was saying before, you have that information inside you, but sometimes it literally is, how do you react when you're on the spot and you're asked to present using your words what you're thinking and that will need a lot of practice and a lot of polishing and that doesn't come naturally to all of us so um so yeah my biggest don't is don't forget that you're very likely what they're looking for um and do definitely practice and about the do with practice sometimes one of the biggest practices is if you're in the room and that's your biggest practice because you won't know what it feels like until you actually um, 
are in front of the panel and you have to answer those questions because not a lot of people get on first time and that's okay or the second time or a few times after that but one of the best ways of practicing at the end of the day is when you're in the room and you can only practice for that as much as you can but do what you can i think for me particularly on this um journey um, has been managing rejection. I think that for me has been the biggest obstacle and trying not to let that affect my self-esteem and things like that because there is a lot of rejection, especially I think if you do decide you want to take this path um, and you're really passionate about it, so you're trying to apply for these jobs, you're trying to get these opportunities and there'll be a lot of no's and there'll be a lot of times when you don't hear back anything and there's a lot of closed doors as well. So I think for me, that was the biggest obstacle and trying to pick myself up again and saying, actually, it's okay, let's just try again. So, and I, and I think a big part of that, again, is this whole thing about there, like living your life outside of clinical psychology as well and having like good support systems in place as in people that you can talk to, people that understand, but also like doing hobbies and interests and doing things you enjoy. Um, will help to kind of buffer that but um i think the biggest obstacle and i think for a lot of people that are on this journey is is dealing with rejection and i think just to be aware of that when you're going in that that it's not easy um but it will probably be worth it so how did i manage to get over those obstacles i think um trying over and over again but then also i think it gets to a point where you're trying over and over again and you're actually like why isn't this working so getting people in the field to check my forms i think a big thing for me was actually through the bme mentoring scheme because i got um a mentor who actually said this is what you need to do to you've actually i think i used to always look at application forms and be like i haven't got any of these skills and then actually getting some, someone actually say to me, actually, you do have that, you do have that, you do have that, but this is how you write it on the form. I think that was a big eye-opener for me. Um, so as much as trying, there is something very important about having people in the field, people to guide you, having mentors, having even peers to talk to. Um, for example, in the Minorities in Clinical Psychology group, there are people that you know are on the same path and having the same kind of difficulties. Um, so for me, is yeah, overcoming was seeking mentors um, and also just seeking support from people in the profession, but also out of the profession as well. Um, my experience of training so far has had lots of ups and downs, I'd say. Um, I think be ready for that, like that for me, yeah, it was be ready for the academic side and be ready for the clinical side. And it was both things that I really looked forward to. So I was always like, I'm gonna handle it. I know it's competitive, but I'm really gonna enjoy it. And the academic has been hard and the clinical has been hard. And I think what I didn't really expect is the emotional side of it as well. And I think that's something that you're not necessarily thinking of when you're trying to get onto the course, but training, yeah, has had yeah, the academic stress, the clinical stress, and just like the emotional stress of the whole thing. Um, that being said, um, sometimes I'm in lectures and I'm like, wow, I'm like so blessed to be here and like listening and learning and um, about things that I don't have access to, or I've never learned about in my life. I think that's been really insightful, really interesting and really contributed to like the evolution of the way I think of who I am as a person. So it definitely goes like this, but um, overall so far, it's been a really like, yeah, like can't even describe, like an undescribable experience until you're kind of there. Um, but yes, I would say definitely up and down. So I think for me, again, coming from, um, a mixed Asian background has been a very, again, another up and down experience. I think in the sense of downs, I think there's times where you're on training and you're like, actually, I don't agree with what's being said, or I'm a bit offended by what we're talking about right now, about the way we're discussing people and culture. And 
and even in clinical services I think sometimes just looking around and just actually do I fit in here like I don't look like the rest of the psychology team and I'm a training clinical psychologist so what does that mean um so yeah a lot of reflecting some really difficult times where you're just thinking that I don't really understand or really trying to make sense of things um there are definitely like ups because you do find people that have either talking about similar have similar thoughts or feelings when it comes to like um, race and culture but also other minoritized experiences so like people that have like survived the psychiatric system and who feel really powerful who feel really affected by what they hear in lectures so have being able to have conversations about that with people that are maybe um disabled in some way or and all the intersections that come with that you really I think particularly if you come from like um, some kind of minoritized background, you really do end up reflecting on on what it means to be the identity you are while you're on clinical training. Um, so I guess lots of lots of dads, right, really questioning like, is this for me? Is this the profession I want to be in? Um, but then finding lots of su like support and like-minded people. And then also like really coming to know yourself better, I think. And yeah, what does my culture mean to me? What does my race mean to me? What does my religion mean to me? How has that shaped how I look at the world? How does that shape how other people look at the world? So yeah, lots of ups and downs. Again, really insightful, um, but definitely not easy. And I guess I want to add, because I know the question is, um, what is it like to be a black or Asian minority ethnic? And, I think actually realizing that that we don't all fall equally under that umbrella about how the things that we read about or hear about in lectures or in services all affect us in the same way. Um, I think me as like a mixed Asian woman would would like feel or react to um, statistics about sectioning rates for Black people very different to some of the Black colleagues are training. It's like, um, but that doesn't, yeah. So I think that's really important to mention. I really like to start things about privilege and how things impact people in um, different ways. So I guess what I would say to my 16 year old self is, um, yeah, we can't shy away from it. Um, the doctorate is hard, getting onto clinical psychology is hard. Um, and you really need like a good academic record. So really like study the best that you can. It's just gonna put you in such a good position um, for the future. But saying that, to be honest, to get a good academic record, you need to have a bit of a well-rounded life as well. So do things that you enjoy, try new things. This will really just help you develop, see what you're interested in. Um, and yeah, I think that will, that will prepare you and put you in a good place for whatever you want to do in the future, whether that is clinical psychology or something else. Um, the things that you start thinking about now in terms of things that are outside of psychology will help, these are the things that will help you stand out later on because these are the things that make you a person and different from another person. Um, so yeah, so that would be my, do, my I guess my motto overall is really just work hard but also play hard um, so you can develop into the person you're supposed to be. I think the advice I'd give to my aspiring clinical psychology self is um, that not to give up because you do have something to offer. So you do have something to offer um, to the profession, you do have something to offer um, to the world. You do deserve that post as competitive as it is because you are gonna bring something different to the profession, to your clients, a different way of thinking about mental health or about distress or about um, psychological well-being or the way systems could work better so yeah so to my aspiring clinical psychology self i'd say yeah don't give up like there is so much value you can bring to the profession um and let that keep fueling you to um get there <laughs>